Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and jump into things and get started here. Uh, just a quick note as we begin that this evening's session will be recorded and it will be posted for later access uh, for folks who wanna view it later. Um, welcome to everyone uh, to this evening's conversation with Dr. Ruben Miller. My name is Anthony Burrow. I'm a faculty member of the Department of Human Development and I serve as the director of the Bronfen Brenner Center for Translational Research at Cornell University. Some of us have been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. Uh, that is certainly the case for me. As I think back over the past, I guess, decade or decade and a half, back when I used to follow Dr. Miller around to various Chicago coffee shops, picking his brain for, for ideas. And I remember back then some of the early grumblings of his ideas that I think have really evolved uh, into sort of the rigorous and deep thoughts that we see in the critically acclaimed book he's recently published called Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration. Uh, Dr. Miller is a Chicago native, uh, a sociologist, criminologist, and a social worker uh, who teaches at the University of Chicago in the School of Service, uh, Social Service Administration, where he studies and writes about race, democracy, and the social life of the city. He has been a member of the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton uh, New Jersey, a fellow of the New America Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, and visiting scholar at the University of Texas at Austin and Dartmouth College. Together with the Braun from Brenner Center, tonight's event is co-sponsored by some truly, truly wonderful partners. They include the Cornell Prison Education Program, or CPEP as we know them, the Price Initiative, which refers to the politics, race, immigration, class, and ethnicity initiative, and the Cornell American Studies Program. Representatives from these generous co-sponsors are here this evening, so we welcome them and links to their various websites and initiatives are listed in some of the virtual flyers that have been posted around. So please sure, be sure to check them out as well. Now for tonight's session, we've situated Dr. Miller in conversation with three wonderful scholars whose deep and rigorous scholarship should make for a truly enlightening conversation. These panelists include Dr. Anna Haskins, who will serve as tonight's moderator, Dr. Haskins is an assistant professor of sociology at Cornell, an affiliate of the Center for the Study of Inequality, the Cornell Center for Social Sciences and the Cornell Prison Education Program, the Cornell Pre uh, Population Center and the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research. Also should be joined by Dr. Jamila Mishner, who's an associate professor of government at Cornell. She studies poverty, racism and public policy with particular emphasis on health and housing. Dr. Mishner is author of the book, Fragmented Democracy, Medicaid, Federalism, and Unequal Politics. She's co-director of the Cornell Center for Health Equity and co-director of the Politics of Race, Immigration, Class, and Ethnicity Research Initiative and board chair of the prison, uh, Cornell Prison Education Program. Last but not least, they'll be joined by Dr. Julili kohler Hausman, who is an associate professor of history and American studies at Cornell. She studies the United States to focus on political, legal, social, and women's history after World War II. She is the author of Getting Tough, Welfare, and Imprisonment in 1970s America, and is currently writing a history of U.S. democracy since the 1965 Voting Rights Act through the lens of non-voters. Of course, for questions and comments that might come up for you throughout the conversation tonight, please drop them in the Q&A, and we'll be reserving and collecting those, and the moderator in about 45 minutes from now will turn to those questions uh, to share with Dr. Miller as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Haskins. Yeah, remember to unmute too. This is, we're off, we're off to a good start. Um, I am so excited for this opportunity. I think probably uh, Julie and Jamila and Ruben, you guys can unmute too, because we're going to start our conversations. Um, you know, I think uh, as Tony um, introduced, like this is a, an incredibly exciting conversation for us to be in with uh, with you, Ruben. Um, we are huge fans <laughs> of your work and um, and this book in particular, and so. Um, before we get started with the questions, because we could pepper you all night, um, the first thing we want to know, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and sort of why you felt the calling to write Halfway Home, um, and what you might have hoped the book would accomplish or catalyze. Thank you so much. This is such an honor. It's, it's, it's just a real joy uh, to be with you three and, and my brother, uh, Tony, uh, Professor Burrow. And the, so, so I wanted to... Uh, call attention to uh, how, 
how criminal justice policy is experienced. I was, I was at first interested in the relationship between punishment and social welfare. And, and so my training, uh, uh, well, first as, as, as a social worker, but then as a sociologist in, in, in political sociology, focusing on the welfare state, um, you know, one of the reasons why I'm super excited about Professor Mishner uh, and being in conversation and, 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 and punishment and how the two work together. Um, uh, and so anyway, so, so, so I went about doing the work and, and uh, following people in jails, prisons, and detention centers. Well, that was the research. Before that, I was a volunteer chaplain at the Cook County Jail for about five years. And so that was from 2003 to 2008, where I visit with men a couple of days a week, four to six hours a day, uh, mostly praying with them, but also sitting with their family members, spending time, uh, helping them get through health crises because of the concentration of uh, 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 health crises in places like jails and prisons mm -hmm. um, uh, that, 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 that's produced something of a death trap now in, in, in the middle of the COVID pandemic. But anyway, that was the work that got me started. I went to graduate school to study mass incarceration, try to understand so many people who looked like me were moving in and out of the, the, the Cook County Jail. Uh, with this interest in the relationship between how we care for folks and how we punish folks. Anyway, when I started writing the book, uh, my brother, my brother uh, went to prison. He had been to prison before. Uh, I think I just didn't notice uh, because I was born poor and black after 1972. This is the year that mass incarceration begins right. in earnest. And so, and so, you know, as, as, as a black man growing up in on, on the south side of Chicago, uh, in, in in the neighborhood that I grew up on, the low end of Chicago. Uh, 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 you couldn't avoid the prison. I couldn't have avoided it if I wanted to. So, so I didn't start studying uh, mass incarceration and punishment and, 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 and what I call the afterlife of incarceration or the way that prison follows people out because of a family connection or even on, on, on some level because of a, 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 a moral impulse because say it was the right thing to do was really a curiosity, something I was interested in. Certainly a part of an ethical commitment that I had, but it was certainly something I was interested in. But, but I couldn't have avoided the prison if I wanted to. And so, and so the book became what it is um, uh, because I decided to, to allow uh, 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 my, my experience, the totality of my experience as a chaplain, as the uh, brother of a formerly incarcerated man, as the son of a father who did 20 years, um, again, that I didn't meet until I was in my 20s. And so I didn't even know until after I started doing this work. Um, but as the father and son of, of incarcerated men, um, I decided to allow kind of more of the fullness of who I think I am uh, into the book, which is sort of how the book was born. Yeah, yeah. I love, so I can keep going. Um, I don't know if, if my my sisters want to want to jump in with something. Yeah, Julie. Well, I think the problem is we're all going to be wanting to jump in like all the whole time. So, <laughs> um, so I just want to say, that, again, this is such an honor to be part of this conversation with some of my favorite uh, writers and thinkers in the world. So it's just an honor to be here and it's exciting to see so many people on the um, that, that made the time to come. Um, I want to kind of sort of piggyback on Anna, Anna, uh, Professor Haskins. Um, let's, you know, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> Professor Haskins question, which is, so, but was there something about the afterlives of incarceration that drew you? Like what made you focus? Because this book is focused on this in some ways on this post moment, right? More, that's sort of one of the central um, questions that it's that it that it's asking. And I'm wondering what, what made you move towards that? Cause it really, I mean, I, maybe this is part of the answer. It hasn't gotten as much attention, I yeah. think, in, um, in maybe even the popular kind of talking about mass incarceration and even in the literature. So I'm just wondering what made, you know, what, what was it that drew you to that, to, to focus your research on that so intensely? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for, for that uh, uh, question. Uh, really, uh, okay, so so um, you're right. On the one hand, all the attention it felt like to me is is on the prison. And, and there needs to be the 2.3 million people who are locked up in the United States. You know, 5% of the, the, the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners looking like COVID, right? <laughs> uh, 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 and, then, and then racial disparities in the prisons are egregious. You know, black folks are five times more likely to be incarcerated, you know, twice as likely to be arrested to begin with, do more time, you know, all these things. And this is incredible. And this is egregious. And this is fundamentally wrong and awful. Um, but 
there's an equally historic uh, phenomenon hidden in plain sight, which was the rise of what I call the supervised society. And this, this was not getting attention. So while 2.3 million people are in American jail or prison, even the numbers say to us that we should pay some attention to the community. There's something like 19.6 million people with a felony record who, who are alive in this country. Uh, 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 you know, uh, 12 million people cycle in and out of an American jail each year. You know, 80 million Americans have a criminal record of some kind. 49% uh, of black men will be arrested before they turn 23, but, 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 but a striking 39% of, 38%, I'm sorry, of white boys, and I do mean boys, will be arrested before they turn 23 years old. Most of them will never go to prison. Most folks will have their charges dropped. And so, 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 and so people live with a criminal record, with police contact, Community, it seems to me, is where the action is. And the prison, despite its place in the public's imagination, is one relatively small slice mm -hmm. of, 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 this, of this giant carceral network. That's part one, part two. The story is so linear, so when people pay attention to, to, to what happens after incarceration, they pretend like it's an event that happens in someone's life maybe once. You know, you get arrested, you come home, and then a set of services respond to your needs or something like that, because you've now been through a traumatic experience, you know? And so, and so, and so, and so the, the, the way out of that is, 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 is some training to help you not be criminal. You know, like th this is our response to it, because we think that, 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 that what people call reentry is an event. But another thing that I wanted to do really was break the linear, the, the, this, this sort of linear narrative about what happens to people you know you get in trouble when you're a kid because because you're bad or 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 even the world hates you you know you're a product of the environment or a super predator this is the frame you know <laughs> so it's the right that, that we've inherited 1990s plus and so work like yours work like work like mine i hope um work like anna's uh, you know helps us understand the the, the 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 machinations the things involved in the production of these bad people that we then throw away or something like that but 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 the but the narrative's like, yo, like hear these bad kids, these bad kids get arrested, these bad kids go to prison, these bad kids come home. But you know, if we look at the most recent and comprehensive recidivism study to date, um, we see a staggering number of people who go back. We know that something like 83% of folks go back, 83, 85, something like that, after nine years. Uh, two thirds after, after or seventy seven percent after just five half within the first year. So we know we know people cycle, um, but the number of 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 average arrests forty four percent of that sample have been arrested ten or more times when, when that when that study was done in, in two thousand ten. So people are moving in and out of these spaces over and over again in different kinds of spaces, and then there are the many different kinds of cages that we've constructed. Uh, job core, which we view as a good, uh, I'm not saying that it's awful, but, 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 but if you talk to a kid about how they experience it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a contained community. It's somewhere they can't leave. Group homes, which I've had personal experience with. I've had brothers who've gone in and out of group homes. I, was, I grew up in uh, foster care for the first few years of my life. Uh, 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 juvenile detention. There are 90,000 types of cages in the prison of one's home community. So anyway, the narrative about mass incarceration and what it does in the social world is, is, is a fairly, in, in my mind, is a, is a fairly narrow um, uh, narrative. It's a fairly narrow discussion that we're having about what mass incarceration is and what it does. And I wanted to take seriously what it does, what it does historically, what it does to family, what it does to the worlds of work, what it does, the, 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 the work that it does uh, in the primary social institutions that we think prevent people from engaging in crime and criminality to begin with. And so this is, this is, this is, this is, this is sort of why the, in some ways the focus um, across systems mm -hmm. in the book. You know, so the prison's in there because the prison's important. How can you ignore the prison? And police is in there. How can you ignore the police? The summers burn every summer because every summer uh, there, there's an officer Chauvin or whatever, right? There, there's a, there's a, there, every summer, uh, there's, there's a Tamir Rice. Every summer, there's an Adam Toledo. How can you ignore the police? Oh, of course, the police are there. And of course, the, the specter of American racism uh, is, is, is there because you can't understand the criminal justice system without wrestling with, 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 with our, 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 our history of, 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 of racism. But it's a very present history. It's, it's a history that does work in, in the present moment. 
And so, and so this is this is why this is why I wanted to write across systems, and I and I wanted to use history, for example. This is something I didn't say, and I'm taking too long to ask these questions. <laughs> but, but, but this is also why I want to uh, think carefully about the work that history does in each chapter, not just one. You know, um, uh, so so the the the, the 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 shape of the book, the book is shaped in the way that it's shaped, is expressed in the way that it's expressed, because be, for, for these reasons. Yeah, that's that's perfect. I mean, I I so feel that when I think about reading the book, and you know, I teach this course on Canvas called Prisons, Politics, Policy, and I was like. As I was reading the book, I was thinking, I just can't wait to make this a book in my class. I just can't wait to assign it to students for so many reasons, more than we have the time to address tonight. But one of the ways that I lay out my syllabus in the class, for better or worse, is I try to help students to understand the complexity of the phenomena that we're going to study and to think about it across systems and across life spans, right? So we have a kind of before, during, after structure to the syllabus. We think about before, all the things that happen in people's lives, right? All the various forms of abuse and trauma. And we talk about poverty, we talk all, all of that, that accounts for why people are flowing into prison of all the places they could flow. Um, and then we talk about during, what are some of the experiences that emerge in the context of being incarcerated, whether it's jail or prison or what have you. And then we talk about after, right? Um, and one of the things that I love about this book is that even though it says it's called the afterlife of mass incarceration, and that's certainly like a, a thematic anchor that holds the book down and sort of carries it along, it's actually so much more than that because, because you're so committed to presenting people as people who mm -hmm. have entire lives, who have entire stories, who have entire narratives, who have a before, a during, and an, a continuing on, right? Mm -hmm. Who are really full human beings. You, we get that scope. It's, and we, we're not just thinking about after, like we know something about Ronald's before, you know? Mm -hmm. We know yeah. something about your before, your brother, your so all of these folks who come up in the book. And it's like amazing that we get these rich accounts that not only tell us about the afterlife, but tell us about so much more than that, right? And one of the things I wanted to, I guess, hear you speak to is how you think about all of this complexity in relation to what I find when I teach my class, prisons, politics, policy, students often, I don't know if some of my former prison students are watching this, I hope you are. Um, but what they often, often my students get frustrated with the complexity, like, oh my gosh, like, mm -hmm. well, I can't make heads or tails of this. Mm -hmm. And they want answers, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and the class has policy in the title. So they do expect that, that we're, they're going to learn about some policies, they're going to solve these problems. And, and in the, in the book, there are times you, you really make it clear, like, I don't have, there's no silver bullets waiting for you at the end. <laughs> there's mm -hmm. no pot of gold at the end of this rainbow, right? Mm -hmm. That's gonna make this easy. And mm -hmm. so I just wonder how do you reconcile this, this sometimes what I feel is a tension between really presenting the nuance, the complexity, the full humanity of all the people flowing through these systems and the full implications of these systems while also addressing what I feel is a deep desire many people have for solutions, right? For like mm -hmm. an answer to mm -hmm. these problems. And mm -hmm. I just want to, I want to jump in and, and attach a tiny question at the end of that, which is, what is your intended audience? And I think it has, I mean, it's interesting yeah. to see, you know, think about all of this, right? So who yeah. did you want to read this? And is that a reason why policy isn't front and center? Or is it deeper than that? I'm, yeah, so great. I appreciate, ah, these have been three wonderful questions to kick us off. Okay, okay, yo, so thank you, thank you. Um, for for that, I think that um, I think that I want to steal a um, uh, a response from from my my dissertation chair was a guy named Phil Nyden who's a who's a, a public sociologist. He does a lot of participatory action research. That's kind of his thing. So he tries to bring about policy change through largely aligning with nonprofit organizations and, and, and the majority of not his own work, his own work was on uh, unions and, 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 and kind of the workers movement, but, but a lot of uh, the work that he's done um, in service of his public sociology formed the center 
was largely a valuation work. By the way, that's where I met um, uh, Professor Burrow. I met Tony there uh, because he was a fellow at that center and I was a graduate student. But he says, you know, social problems don't come in neat packages. And, and I just so appreciate that. But it's, it's not just social problems, you know, it's, 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 it's human life. It's, it's just not, it's just not neat, you know, and whether that's we're thinking about the joys of human life or the tragedies associated with human life or the mundane routine everydayness of, of, of human life, you know, everyone we encounter. Uh, 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 can we, can we use first names? I, I call you Lily. I didn't call her Professor yeah. Cola Houseman, but no, uh, and then, and then I I'll start <laughs> but you literally is like the homie, you know. So, so anyway, so, 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 I, but okay, but uh, so, so, let me look. The, 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 the way you phrased the, 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 the before of it, right? Like everybody has a before, and everybody, every, everybody has a past and a present, and everybody's sort of moving on, and everybody encounters. You know, history is is doing work in people's lives, and then people are doing work in their own lives because people have agency. And so if I flatten the experiences of, 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 of people, if I, if, 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 I, if, I, if I then start doling out solutions to problems, one that I don't fully understand um, because I'm taking a disciplinary perch to try to address it. So I can't know sociologically what's going on without thinking about history, biography. You know, C. Wright Mill says the sociological imagination is where biography uh, 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 sort of, sort of meet structure, you know, something like this, like, like biography meets history or something like this. Um, uh, uh, so I can't understand it sociologically if I take on the pretenses of uh, the sociological ma imagination as defined by practitioners today. And, and I, I can't understand uh, uh, the, the complexity of somebody's life if I approach it historically as historians are trained to write about right now or, 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 or political scientists, if I'm thinking about, right, the, the conventions of my discipline, I uh, teach in a school of social work. There's a way to do social work that totally misses how people experience social life. And, and if, I, if I jump to a set of solutions from my disciplinary perch, I'm going to absolutely miss um, uh, what people need, what people are experiencing in a, in a given moment in time, you know, et cetera. Okay, so all that to say, I just did my best. I hope it was successful. To honor, and I'm not fishing for compliments. I, like I'm just saying this. I'm just speaking from 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 just where that comes from. I just try my best to capture uh, people's lives and experiences as I experience the, the them with them, and as they relayed them to me in the moment. So those those two those that was that was the the mo. How honest can I get here with with how they talked to me, how they talked to me, how we felt when, how I felt when I was in a moment with them, uh, uh, how I interpreted the thing, how they checked me when my interpretation was wrong, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. As far as an audience, you know, it's interesting. I've heard a lot of, uh, like folks, I, I, I don't ever give writing advice because I think, uh, I, unless somebody asks me like, like, you know, yo, like help me think through this or that, of course, you know, but like, I don't give like, um, Twitter is a great place for, for writers. Writers give writing advice. So people have these things. They're like, yo, like, you know, spend two hours a day, you know, doing this or draft this or draft that. And then imagine in your head, for example, um, you know, uh, who you want to explain this or that thing to, um, the, the, the question of audience. And, and, and also the question of audience is, is, is in the, the proposal. When you write a book proposal, it's like, who's your audience? And quite honestly, I didn't really have an audience, quite honestly. The, 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 I was just trying to write as honestly as I could. And I tried to write beautifully where I could. And then I tried to write with restraint where I could, you know? And so, so the folks who I appreciated most, so I didn't have a policymaker in my head and I didn't have, um, you know, a generalist, you know, let's say the, whatever the imagination of the general population was necessarily in my head, the people in my head were like Nina Simone, James Baldwin, Fela Kuti, whoever I was listening to in the moment, um, the folks who I shared my work with who would respond sometimes like, yo, this is garbage. <laughs> you know, like, like, what, like, what, like, what are you saying, man? Like the homie David Kazanchian um, uh, from, from, from the uh, University of Pennsylvania, who's a 
uh, he's, he's an American studies guy um, and, and, and just does lo lovely work on, 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 on slavery. He's writing a book now on slavery in the Yucatan. And uh, anyway, uh, you know, he, he, um, uh, he lit up when I, when I said that, you know, uh, I'm not offering you a, a solution. And then we had a long conversation about it and it helped me, it helped me to, to sort of develop that part kind of like, like, yo, like, like no, no five point policy plan. That's a direct quote from him actually. Like, like I, I stole his language. Thank you, David, if you listen to me. <laughs> like, like no five point policy plan, right? Like, uh, and so from him, David was like, yo, like it's absurd after you get through all of this because he read the, uh, the galley. It's absurd after you get through all of this to then be like, yo, do these three things and call me in the morning, you know? And, 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 and that's it. And that's not to express a kind of hopelessness. That's not to say that there's nothing that can be done. It's to say that we have to reimagine how we're approaching this problem with the full humanity of people in view, no matter what our politics are, right? Like, like no, no matter what my personal politics are, what, like, what, like which box do I check about which which groups of people I belong to, that doesn't so much matter. What, what, what matters most is, 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 is how I try to understand um, this person on the page, this person in front of me, this person in my chair, if I'm a therapist or a counselor, you know, this person I'm writing about, if I'm a policymaker, this person I'm researching, uh, this person who I teach about in the classroom, this person who I love uh, and, 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 and care for, there's something in me that has to recognize the deeper parts of them. And the only way to do that is to get in touch with, I think, for me, the only way to do that was to get in touch with the deeper parts of myself, the parts that didn't always feel so good, the parts that felt wonderful on, on, a, on, on a Wednesday for no reason, you know, the, the, like, 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 the, like those, those, those kinds of things. So I, so I didn't really have um, an audience in much the same way that I don't really have, um, and you didn't ask this question, but I just want to say it, like I, like, I don't write every day. I don't really have a process like that, but I'm not wired like that. I'm a little disorganized. Like I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, or more organized people can and, and produce beautiful work. Um, but, but, but for me, it wasn't, it wasn't having that, that specific goal, that specific person who I really, I really want Joe Biden to read this and take it up. Like Joe may never read the book. Like he may never, he may never see it or touch it. I hope he does. If you listen well, Biden, to Joe. Biden, if you're watching, you got to no. get Ruben's book. Let's send Joe the book. President Biden. <laughs> read it, Joe. <laughs> maybe, maybe it makes sense to, I, I always do this like, we've all read the book actually quite closely, but maybe for the people who haven't, who, there's going to be people in the, in the audience that haven't. And I'm wondering if, I don't know, Anna, you maybe, I'm sure you have questions about this too, but like maybe t back up and tell a little bit about, I mean, you did such incredible research, you know, for this book and maybe um, just talk a little bit about what you did and then what you, um, well, let's just do that quickly. And then Anna, I'm sure you have other questions too about no, what the happy, book happy to, happy, happy to. So the, the, the book is three research projects, which sounds a lot drier than I hope it comes out, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> the, the, the first was a dissertation. So it's been three and a half years in Chicago uh, in halfway houses, uh, doing what people do is they go through halfway houses. So doing check-ins, going to classes, you know, eating, doing smoke breaks, spending time with folks, um, uh, trying to participate as, as, as they got, went about their everyday routines um, so that I could understand from my flesh, as it were, from my body, um, what it meant to, to, to be in a place like that. And then uh, I took my first job at the University of Michigan um, and then spent time in Detroit uh, 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 to see, to follow men home. And the reason for that was because I understood what people told me about their home experiences, but I didn't really quite understand. I'm, uh, you know, I was interested in, in experience of social policy and the, the halfway house is one way to experience it. This is a, the evidence-based program as an expression of policymakers' ideals, you know, so, 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 so that was the dissertation, but the, but I didn't know anything about how they lived out the policy process. So I didn't, I didn't know how social policy was, 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 was lived out. So I, so I wanted to follow people home. So in Detroit, I followed 90 people, 60 men and 30 women um, home from uh, prisons and, and a police station lockup facility on the east side of Detroit. Uh, uh, and so, and so then, uh, and, and, and then also followed ethnographically because that's my, you know, kind of my, my, the, the kind of tool of choice for me is, is participant observation. And then, so I followed a small group, um, about eight people in that case, um, 
closely. And then I, I followed a group of activists in New York that, that, were, that were based in New York City, but it was a national network of activists. So I followed them on their campaigns to go about uh, bringing about changes to law and policy. And so that, those three studies um, make up the book. And as I was writing the book, I also included reflections. Reflections is it really undersells the, 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 you know, what I tried to do. But so I mentioned that my brother got locked up while I was inside. I mentioned that I spent five years as a volunteer chaplain. I didn't say from 2003 to 2008. So this is the height of mass incarceration. And so my practice experience, and I also worked with children who had been in group homes, uh, accused of sexual assault. Um, and I did therapy with with um, with with foster children. Uh, this stuff that those two parts aren't aren't forward in the book, but it informed my thinking. But I did therapy with foster children, trying to reunite with their with their families. And so and so, my work experiences, uh, my life experiences, um, are all still sort of weaved in the book as I try to make sense of families coping with um, the loss of a loved one to incarceration. I'm, I'm also wrestling with what it means to care for my own family and what it means to know people very closely uh, 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 who, who are wrestling with the same um, kinds of problems. And so that's, that's, that's halfway home. Yeah. That's the book. So I, I want to jump in and ask, you know, two um, related questions about, you know, sort of what you just said, which is, um, you are not a detached researcher in sort of the <laughs> traditional objective sense um, that we think. And so, and uh, in your appendix, your methodological appendix is a joy and oh, a thank you. contribution in and of itself um, that could be read standalone, I think, for future current, what am I even talking about future, like current <laughs> ethnographic researchers. Um, and you, you title it The Gift of Proximity. Um, and I just, I want you to say a little bit about this idea, you know, you were not a detached researcher mm -hmm. and you actually talk about, you know, history and the importance of history and how history is, you know, interweaved, as you mentioned earlier, through all of the chapters. And that's something that I was really drawn to. Um, but the way you frame it, like it's not just the historical accounting of race and punishment, but the importance of one owns, one's own history, right? Mm -hmm. one, one own, one's own lived experience as key to this accurate portrayal of life, of stories, of research. And so again, this like sort of gift of proximity that you offer, um, you know, a question, right, is, you know, why would you choose to center yourself and your own family's experiences with incarceration in, um, in your research? And then I think, you know, the second part of that really is, you know, you have experience with the criminal legal system in your personal life and sort of, you know, all of the work that you've done. Was there anything that surprised you? Right, so mm -hmm. you said you're a black man raised post 1970s. Yeah. So like, you weren't surprised that your brother went mm -hmm. to prison. Was there anything in this process that did surprise you? I think it's the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate this very much. Um, okay, so the, thank you. For asking about so, so so I'm close to the to the to the to, to the book. I'm close to the people in the book. So my brothers in the book, they're also. Uh, uh, formerly incarcerated activists that I hired as a part of my research team. And so many of them are in the book. Or, uh, uh, and and uh, and these are people who I've known for a very long time. The, 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 the idea about being close. So, so what I think that we're trained to do in the social sciences is, is kind of distance ourselves from ourselves. Like we're taught to divorce ourselves from our passions from our, the sets of experiences that really bring us to the questions that we ask. And so this doesn't mean that, uh, like I don't believe you can't study anything if you're from any background. I don't, I don't think that's right. I think that's silly. Like that's, that's just my position. I don't think you have to be, for example, poor and black to study poor black people and understand them. I think to, to, to study anybody and understand the sets of experiences you have, you have to get proximate to the human condition that we're taught to distance ourselves from in a fear of partisanship. Quite honestly, I think it's kind of a sex panic, right? The, 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 the fear that we're gonna go native and, oh, we're gonna get on with a research participant or something silly, you know, like this, this idea of closeness is taint, right? Like, 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 like this, 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 this deep separation that we do in the, in, in the social sciences where we, where we put up um, uh, 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 an artificial distance between us and the 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 
the things that we, the, the people that we study. We do this whether we're, we're doing ethnographic research or if we're doing, re, you know, admin, uh, doing uh, administrative data analysis. We're doing all these data checks to make sure that we didn't introduce bias. Um, uh, we try to we try to not report uh, or not share uh, uh, our own uh, closeness to it. And, and when we do, when you're a black scholar studying black people, when you're a Latinx scholar studying people uh, who consider Latinx, when you know, on and on, if you're, if you're G, uh, GLBTQ or something like that, you know, it, 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 people dismiss it as, as, as me search or something mm -hmm. like that. And so, and so, the, so, so, so then we work extra hard to, to, to now write dispassionately to prove we're scientists. Um, and so I think that you get something from that important. I think that there's something important about objectivity. I think there's something to be learned um, from distance. Um, but I think there's something to be learned from closeness. There's something also to be learned from allowing yourself to be moved by a set of experiences. Because when you allow yourself to be moved by a set of experiences, when you allow yourself to be vulnerable, it, it, it allows you not only to understand vulnerability in a particular kind of way, um, but but it also allows you to connect with people in ways that 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 you weren't able to previously connect with people. So so there's an insight that you gain by allowing yourself to be close, to allow yourself to be open, to allow yourself to be vulnerable, which means to allow yourself to be hurt sometimes. There's an insight that you gain into say pain, um, but there's also an insight that you gain in the pleasures and in, in, in the routine uh, everydayness of life, because you feel it, you feel it, um, and 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 there's something that the reader gains when you allow things to be close to you and you express it. You allow yourself to express it. This isn't for everybody, uh, but but for folks who are interested in doing this, when you allow when you allow yourself to express it, then the reader has information that they need to evaluate the claims that you make. So if I say the book, one of the, the, the takeaways from the book is that mass incarceration is about citizenship because citizenship is about belonging. And I'm, I'm trying to make the case across the book that, that, that uh, uh, people are, there's, that, that people are excluded from every kind of place that might be made for them. So I can tell you that and you can see that and you can evaluate whether or not I've dispassionately displayed that and I can also show you that so that you feel what I feel as you as you as you walk through the text with me. And 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 so and so and so it's it's not just a, a technique of data presentation, it's also an analytic, the experience, the emotionality of it, the texture of social life, to be able to to, to be in it with uh, the person allows you to see things that you wouldn't ordinarily see and allows the reader to assess whether or not you're right. <laughs> right. So, so, so now, now you can now you can tell me like yo you can say okay that works in theory but does it work in practice is the thing that we hear all the time. Well, well, allowing myself to get close eliminates some of the distance between the 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 the, the artificial by the way distance between theory between be, between theory and practice. There was a second question, um, uh, uh, and the second question was. Um, the second question was just that, was there anything that surprised you? You know, yeah. given your proximity, was there anything that was surprising? Once yeah. you did the actual research, yeah. In, in that, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, uh, because, um, yes, because people's lives are so very different. Mm -hmm. Yes, because, because uh, people's lives are, are, are because because there's no there's no actual cookie cutters that 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 work, and so and so and so I might have an understanding of so, so I'll, I'll give you I'll, I'll give I'll give you an example of something that was surprising is 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 not is a, is a is a strong word. This is something that doesn't show up in the book, it, so it's not really surprising. It's it's it was revelatory. So I followed somebody who got out of out of prison, and so I interviewed him in the Detroit Center, and then my partner interviewed his son. Uh, my, my research partner, Ronald, actually. So Ronald from the book interviews his son. So we're in separate offices. He's interviewing the son. I'm interviewing the father. The son is taking on the responsibility 
uh, for for the father. And then my student, one of my one of my students, is interviewing the sister, his sister, who's who who used to take him in. So now we have his like a continuum of care for this man. So I got him, me and two undergraduates in the room. And then there's a graduate student in the office who's talking to his sister who usually cares for him. And then there's and then there's then there's Ronald talking to his son who's going to take on the responsibility of 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 of, of caring for him uh, when things happen. So something I learned about this network, this beautiful network of people who are caring for this what we would call able-bodied man who are, frustrate lots of folks uh, if, if he was sleeping on that couch drinking their orange juice and, and and not bringing home you know any paper because of course he's locked out of the labor market because of course he's heard no 60,000 times because of course he struggles with an addiction and makes bad decisions too right so like like all of this creates frustration but something I learned uh, about the the, the 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 depth of care in that mm -hmm. network was astounding the sisters would take turns caring for this man they each lived in a different suburb of Detroit so he had three sisters and they would take shifts when he moved in and out of jail, letting them sleep on each other's couch. And they would bring food that they keep in their deep freezers for when, when there were times of plenty because, because they knew that when the sister took on, took on the brother that they would need extra support. So now the three sisters are bringing the food from the deep freezer to the son's house, who's been waiting and looking forward with great expectation to the day that he's taking his father. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this to me was so powerful. This isn't in the book. <laughs> I should have told the story. Like I, said, I should have told a story that's in the book. But this is right. But but it's but it's, it's like it's like it's like moments like this, where there's the frustration, the bad decision making, the 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 the, the you know name name your problem. And he was healthier than all of them. Three of the sisters, all three had a disability. He was healthier than all three of them. That would have frustrated me. But 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 this but this but this commitment to this man. And, 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 and this deep understanding that they know that there's going to be a time when that bridge gets burned and then it's my shift. Yep. And then that bridge is going to get burned. This man has no opportunity. It's my shift. And then the son says, it's my shift. They created a network of care for someone who's been thrown away. So, 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 so yeah, that was absolutely surprising. And it was quite beautiful. And there were moments like this um, throughout the book of beauty and deep pain. Uh, uh, that, 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 that really, that really captured me. And that's humanity, right? <laughs> like that is it, right? The beauty and the deep pain. Um, Jamila, do you want to, do you want to? Uh, I was just going to say, and I love that you present people in all of their flaws, right? Mm. It's not like you try to present us with all the people who are innocent, you know, mm -hmm. quote unquote, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we get to see people in the, the full depth of like their flawed human nature. Um, at the same time, like you, as you understand, there's a way in which I feel like you bring to the fore the human condition in terms of like human frailty and human dignity and the fact that sometimes we make bad decisions or mm -hmm. we respond to things. I'm like, well, I don't know how I respond to life if I'm Ronald, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what I do when I get to the point where it's like, my father's dead and my mother killed him, my, you know? And mm -hmm. like, maybe then I do go and make some bad decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And like, who am I to judge him? But like, one thing I struggled with is, not struggled with, but it really like kind of pushed me as a political scientist to think like, something that I don't think we think enough, which is what role is the state supposed to play, right? Yeah. In yeah. navigating the realities of human frailty, weakness, and just a deep, profound flaws. We make mistakes, mm -hmm. we make the wrong choice, we do the wrong thing. We, you know, because we're, we're traumatized or we're hurt or we just, we're being, you know, we're stubborn or for a wide variety of reasons like, you know, we have this logic of personal responsibility that many people feel strongly about. Um, but then there's like, we get down to this basic level of what is our commitment to one another. And what I felt like you were saying in the book, what I heard you saying was like, you're showing us people who in various ways have deep commitments to one another and some of the consequences of, of the, the commitments that don't get reflected in, in, in what the state does and does not do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you said initially you were interested in the relationship between care and punishment, in, in my view, it's like the punishment piece shows us how little like we That's really right. know what care means, like how That's to right. articulate that through policy, through the state, through through our even our politics, even though and that doesn't have to be partisan politics, just our our, our what we're prioritizing. And so how do you think about like the role of the state in all this? It's not about like what policy changes need to happen. 
Sure. It's about like, what, how do you, how does a, any political community, any state confront the vast array of just human weaknesses that we're forced to, to, to understand more deeply through your text? Yeah, it's such a it's such a great question. So so if we look at places where the scale of incarceration um, doesn't match ours, which is everywhere else in the world, we see a more developed welfare state mm -hmm. with almost without question, almost without exception. Everywhere else we look, where the scale of incarceration doesn't match ours, doesn't match, doesn't look like it's trying to approximate, doesn't right, it doesn't doesn't come near, doesn't touch ours. Um, uh, the welfare state is 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 better developed. Um, but in those same places, um, the UK, Canada, uh, any of the Scandinavian countries, uh, where where and, and you know we're going down the list, right? It gets smaller and smaller. So Canada closer to us, more like us. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the scale is closer to ours and say, you know, hop over to Europe. Um, uh, and, you know, as we go to the, the model welfare states in Norway, where, where prisoners are treated like people, so says uh, a headline in The Guardian. If you look, they have all the same problems we have. They don't have them at the scale that we have them. So, so, so all the, the Scandinavian prisons are one third or more foreign nationals. Mm -hmm. so, so in other words, they have an otherwise population that they lock away and treat like trash. This is something that we have to, right? Like this, this is what we have to wrestle with when folks start doing their tours of German prisons or, or when they go to the Scandinavian prisons. You know, uh, when I was, when I visited prisons and uh, in, I was doing a little field work and I got a chance to visit, do a prison visit in, uh, in, in Malmo, uh, uh, Sweden. And uh, the scale was tiny, 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 but the people I talked to were all Iraqis for whatever reason, uh, as, as I was touring through these prisons. prisons. When I got a chance to visit the prisons in Belgrade, a welfare state in transition that made some decisions that looked very different than our decisions. The scale is vastly different. When I looked inside the Serbian prisons, I saw Bosnians uh, oh, oh, over, 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 overwhelmingly. Uh, 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 and, so, and, so, and so the, the problems of otherizing the, the, the production of a pariah class happens uh, in every, it, it, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is what I think I'm finding, uh, the construction of a pariah class, even if it's not a racialized construction. So even if, I mean, racialized in the ways that we think about race in the US, but certainly racialized in that um, the, the qualities are essentialized. So if you, you know, when I went to Glasgow and I spent time in prison in, 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 in Scotland, I found that uh, prisoners were white because there's very little immigration. In, in, a, in a place like Scotland. Scotland doesn't have as much immigration as say we do. Um, uh, and, 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 and there just aren't as many um, minority populations. Go to the UK generally, BAME prisoners, Black, Asian, you know, et cetera, um, are, 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 are like something like 14 or 15% of the population, 25% of the prisoners. Racial disparity in police stops and incarceration is worth the disparity than it is in the US. So they've got all the same racial issues, the production of the other, but the scale of incarceration and the quality of life and the general health and well-being is so much better because they have a different kind of commitment to their poor, to the people that they leave behind. I'm not saying this is not a uh, this is like a class issue or something like silly. That's not it's not my point. I'm not saying that race doesn't matter. I'm saying that um, the state um, should have a commitment at the very least to try its best to do no harm. And right now, the role that the state plays is one of harm, one of exclusion at every moment. Um, from cradle to grave, the state is operating in such a way that it excludes people from the life-giving institutions of a free society, rather than investing in those institutions. So, 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 so one role that, that we might think about, and this is why I'm not writing, like I didn't write a five-point policy plan because it's more like a theme. One question we might ask that we haven't asked ourselves is how might, how are we, like, so, so, so the, the, the people on, on the spectrum of politics when they think about, for example, the criminal justice system, get rid of it altogether, right? The abolitionists, um, uh, 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 and, and then there are folks who are reformers who, who believe in reform in, in different ways, and there are folks who are who believe that the system can operate justly. So the reformers who believe that the, the thing needs to be changed and it's garbage. The people who believe it's total garbage throw it away. There are people who believe 
um, uh, that 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 it works right, but 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 needs some tweaks. Like wherever you fall in the spectrum, a question that we're not asking is how might the state, the nation state, strengthen the family rather than take away. So what role might what we call the criminal legal system have in, for example, helping families absorb? Uh, uh, you know, all this all this excess that we leave because we lock people out of the political economy and culture. One of the engines that drive the book, and please jump in, um, uh, one of the engines that drive the book are the 45,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that target people with criminal records. Those are specific laws, policies, and sanctions that target them and only them. In a, in a, in a, so, 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 so we inc over incarcerate women Women's incarceration has quadrupled at the same rate. You know, these are things that we know, but yet and still about 90, 95%, 93%, 92% of the people who we incarcerate are men. And we know that we have this, this vision of men in the workplace. You know, I'm thinking about an exchange that, that you've engaged in multiple times in the, in the media, right? Like this, 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 this valorization of work. This, this, this fear of the idle poor, this, the, the construction of the pauper that comes from uh, England and, and, and lands here and, and resonates in such a powerful way across all of our institutions that the idle poor are the, is, is sort of the, 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 the is, is the, is the vector of criminality and disease, by the way, and, and every sort of social ill. Anyway, um, Ah, I was I was on the track. Ah, just like that, just like that, just like that. Just like, um, well, this will give Julie a chance to. to yeah, did you yeah, jump in, a please. little sparkle. Well, no, I, I, he was. I think he was actually doing going where I was going to ask you to go. Exactly. Which is, I think that for some people, I think one of the things, at least when I teach this, to to Jamila's point, I think that in sort of popular understanding, there is a sense that sort of people go to prison, they quote serve their time, you know, and then they go out and you know like. Maybe they have a tough time, but I mean, one of the things that people who haven't gotten to read your book and you were starting to reference this, like might not just have a sense of exactly what your, what, I mean, maybe you could give a, just talk a little bit about what your argument or what your book shows about what people actually do face when they come yeah. out of prison. Like, what are the afterlifes of mass incarceration? Like, what do we make of the state's sort of I mean, some sections of the state's purported commitment to rehabilitation or reintegration, and what is the actual experience that you found that people confronted? Like, you know, what what did what did re reintegration yeah. and rehabilitation into society? I'm sorry, I'm throwing a lot of air quotes here. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think your book shows that all of those things need like more than air quotes. Like, um, so can you talk just a little bit about what? Not only what sort of people found, you started mentioning all these laws and all That's these right. policies, but also I'd be curious to know sort of with the people that you inter interviewed, what did they see, think was happening? What did they say the state was doing? What was the mm -hmm. state's work? You know, like, because obviously, not to be a spoiler alert, I think they're going to say that it didn't feel a lot like a, a, a loving reentry and embrace. So talk a little bit about what you, about what you show us in the book. Not that people shouldn't still buy it, by the way. This is, <laughs> this is a teaser. And also, just to follow up too, I mean, I think after um, after Ruben, you think about this question, um, we're going to actually have some questions from formerly incarcerated individuals oh, that are alumni of the Cornell Prison Education Program that have some, you know, sort of follow through with sort of what do you think one should do after. So, mm -hmm. would love to hear, you know, your answer to Julie's question, and then we'll transition to those questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Julie. Thank you for also bringing me back to, 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 to this point that I was uh, that, 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 that this, 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 this path that we were walking down. Um, OK, so so people encounter the, the, uh, the, the something I call the economy of favors that drives this this thing. And so, and so, and so to explain what this is, 45,000 laws, policies and sanctions, a lot of people out of the labor market. And this point about men, you know, everything around everything in the world tells men and also women, tons of women, but but the vision is of, of, of sort of a masculine provider, right? So like, like everything in the world tells you you're to provide. And then you walk out of prison and then 19,000 employment regulations for everybody with a criminal record. So, so, so what you're told you must do, what, you, what you're told you're supposed to do, the thing you do to be a, 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 a good citizen, a good person, a good father, a good, a good, a good family person, a good mother, a good contributor. I mean, we know welfare reform and, and, and the punishment of mothers, uh, and, and you know the, the, the necessity of work. Everything tells you to be good 
um, you must you must be productive. But 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 all these regulations um, limit your productivity. So 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 nineteen thousand employment restrictions that bar you from whole categories of employment. Um, and so and so my brother, uh, for example, got a truck driver's license while he was out, uh, and then and then and then was told that he couldn't leave the state. So it's so 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 this was is, this is one 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 major frustration, and then was surprised um, how and why someone like that might get discouraged. Um, uh, uh, so 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 the economy of favors uh, is 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 tries to capture um, on the one hand the laws, policies, and sanctions that prevent you from fully participating in the political economy and culture. Um, you might have been trained as a barber in prison. Uh, uh, in, in the state of Illinois, it wasn't until a, 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 a legislation was passed in 2016 that allowed you access to you to get a barber's or beautician's license. It's it's the it's the good character clause that prevents you from getting a real estate license. It's the it's the you know on and on and on whole ca hundreds of categories of employment that you're barred from. Well, that's on the one side. You, you, you're locked out of the political economy and culture to participate in in informal ways. The ways that we think are the best way to participate. Mm -hmm. And then the other side. There are interpretations of liability law that we see happen beginning in the 1980s that hold employers, landlords, licensing officials accountable. This will be through nuisance ordinances. Uh, uh, this will be through lawsuits, reputation loss, the loss of, 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 of insurance if you're a social service agency. All of these things, if you, if you cater to the needs of a particular type of person with a felony record. And so on the one hand, you're locked out and you're made needy. On the other hand, people who help you will be punished. So much so that if you sleep on the couch of, of your grandmother uh, uh, who, who, who lives in public housing, she can be evicted. That, that started in 1996. And so, and so there's this pincer move where on the one hand, you're made needy uh, by the state, the state doing harm. And on the other hand, you're made among the least desirable candidates to help, people who would help you are punished. And so you have to elicit favors uh, from folks who are harmed if they help you, but a favor uh, in, in our society for folks uh, with criminal records are, are leasing an apartment to a well-qualified candidate, hiring somebody who might be well-suited for the job. And so the way people experienced this was through the lockout and through this dance that folks are made to do to prove to others that, that they're worth taking a risk on. And this is, I think, an unaccounted for a burden. Um, it's, it's something we don't, we don't tend to think about uh, uh, readily uh, when, we, when we think about questions of mass incarceration. This is great because this leads us directly to some of the questions from um, the CPEP alumni. And so for those that don't know, um, Cornell uh, hosts a uh, prison program. So it's called CPEP, the Cornell Prison Education Program. And it's been around for over 15 years and it serves um, it teach it brings college Cornell level co college classes to uh, four upstate New York prisons, um, and it has graduated um, a number of individuals. And this is you know, we just have a post so if you guys are if uh, the audience is interested in and in following through with what the CPEP program does. And so many of the CPEP com um, community and alumni read your book, Ruben, and they came. Um, they sent some questions, and so related directly to what you were just talking about, Tyler and Robert both asked versions of this question, which is, you know, what would you like to see in place as a standard to help formerly incarcerated men and women re-enter society? In essence, you know, what is your advice and also sort of what is your advice for recently released individuals having to go through all these obstacles um, that are really, that really set them up to fail? I think that there are 45,000 laws, policies, administrative sanctions, and I think we don't, and I, I don't think we need them. I think this is a wonderful place to start. I think, I think, I think that, that we can ask, you know, you know, in, in the state of Illinois, you couldn't groom a dog uh, if, 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 if you had a, if you were if you were convicted of, a, of, 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 of particular kinds of felony like it's, And so and so and so one question could be, um, uh, is the the, the 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 collateral consequence, does it make sense? Does it target like do we need this? There's a in 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 this in New York City there's there's something called the Human Rights Commission and what the Human Rights Commission does is they sue on behalf of New Yorkers who are who are who have their their rights violated and and among New Yorkers who they sue on behalf of are people with criminal records and so if you're denied an apartment based on your criminal record and the criminal record 
the record that you have doesn't directly relate to some reasonable reason why, say an employer or a landlord or somebody like that would deny your your your, your right, um, uh, then then they launch a lawsuit. Here's the thing that I think is quite radical about that. Um, it, it doesn't work in every case. Sometimes it triggers something called an Article 23 audit. So there, there's all these like legal maneuverings that, that sort of get triggered. Um, uh, but I find that people in New York City tend to do better than people in some cities like Detroit or something like that um, because they don't have the same kind of enforcement apparatus. Well, enforcement of what? The enforcement of one's rights as a citizen, the idea of protections. Like this, this is something that we don't think about when we think about this group. We think about this group as dangerous. And, and so to, to, to shift the framework and say, yo, like these are real people, real flesh and blood people that deserve all the same rights, privileges, and even protections of those rights and privileges as everyone else um, is, 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 is really um, a quite radical departure from what we're looking at which is largely a service-based model. I've sat in on commissions at different cities and, at, and in a few states for a governor or two and a mayor or three uh, uh, trying to address questions of what do you do with the returning citizen? This is the language that they've adopted because they're trying to sound progressive now. So they wanna sound like, you know, we're ready for some big radical change. And the response is a new social service. The response is, cognitive behavioral therapy to help people uh, reframe uh, the, the, the conditions in which they live. The response is provide substance abuse treatment. The response is some sort of behavioral intervention. Uh, and, and this is because the model is a model of service. It's not a model of protection. It's not a model of inclusion. It's a, it's, it's, it's a model that says, we wanna help you muscle through all the exclusion that you face. And, and, and this, I think, Shifting the framework is is, 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 is is the beginning of addressing these problems. That's really interesting because so Jess notes his question. I see Jamila's like, I want to I want to get in. <laughs> no, so, no. so Jess writes, um, it seems to me that any attempt made to reform the current system mutates into some strange tentacle of the system as a whole. Um, he says that is even uh, movements toward abolition seem to operate inside this sort of systemic super arena that is the carceral state. And so um, this sort of sounds like, you know, whenever we're trying to do something that's reform, then it, but it still is packaged in the same sort of system. And so he asks, you know, do you find value in, in pushing an abolitionist agenda, um, an abolitionist agenda within the very framework that breathes, breathes, breathes life into um, this industrial monstrosity? And so, I mean, I think that that raises a lot of questions in some sense about you know what is how do we do reform if it sometimes feels like it's sort of still within this giant thing that we call the carceral state i, I appreciate this question a lot the thing that i really like about what abolitionists are doing is they're forcing us to engage in a positive project of building society anew and so their question is what if we el eliminated jails and prisons, what kind of world would we build in its place? And it mm -hmm. would be a world built on a politics of care rather than um, you know, a politics of punishment or coercion or something like that. And so for that reason, and not that reason alone, but, but, but that for me is one giant reason why I think we're in a wonderful time right now where, where, where folks who, who believe in prison abolition um, and, and, and things just short of that, you know, you know, defunding the police, for example, isn't the same thing as abolition, though, though a lot of abolitionists are certainly behind it um, uh, because they see it as a step or something like that toward abolition. But the idea of, you know, what do you do with this capacity that you have? What happens when you free up the capacity to sort of do new things? But I think that's the kind of radical imagining that we need, not only um, in this moment for some utopian future, but to help us get over the framework that we've been operating in. Again, when we think about formerly incarcerated people, the first thing that comes to our mind is a service. And it's not to say the services are bad. Prisoner reentry organizations, for example, relieve real human suffering in real time. They provide food, clothing, shelter. These are run by some crooks, of course, like every uh, sort of entity, uh, like every kind of organization, if you look closely enough at the most utopic move, think socialism, think abolition, think any of it. You know, think the Black freedom struggle. I mean, read any any of these folks' uh, autobiographies. Read autobiographies of people who've been affected by a lot of the charismatic leaders that have come through. And then you, you'll see the underside of every positive movement for social change, of course, because people are 
whack sometimes. It's 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 it is what it is, right? So 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 um so you 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 you'll see you'll see problems and flaws, but but the whole framework. The whole framework is a framework of service. And so, and so, and so what reentry programs, what programming can't do, what service can't do, a service can't address the structural problems that it's that they're embedded in. And so you need a new way to think about the problems that we face to begin with. And this is this is what I think abolition is providing us um, right now and 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 has provided uh, historically. Can I say one quick thing? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. This, I love that you're providing us with, a, are, are prompting us to think about a, a kind of shift in, in our frameworks, right? Not just a framework of charity or framework of service, but a framework of thinking about, you know, you know, protecting people's rights and a kind of affirmatively advancing their citizenship and, and, and including them, right, in our political community. And the only thing I would add to that, that I think like, that uh, just a word I want to be in the ether that I want us to be thinking about as we like talk about reimagining a framework is is power, right? That's right. That's like right. a framework of empowerment where people's rights are protected, right? And that's a kind of like protection from. But then there's also like an affirmative like right. ability to that you get to like that. I love the question that this questioner asked, but how do we break out of the same old, same old by having a completely different quote unquote class of people who are informing the work and who are advancing the projects and who are you know responsible for the changes that are happening. And for those to be the folks who are affected and who have the most at stake and not far away detached people who are never going to experience any of the things that we learn about um, in your book. For those to be the folks that have power, like that would be truly revolutionary. We don't even know what that would produce because we've mm -hmm. never had anything like that ever. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's so fascinating about the frame that Ruben has without, throughout the book, which is mass incarceration is really about citizenship. I mean, I yeah. think you say that three or four times. And I think what you're, I mean, at least what I'm hearing you saying is that the first step is just a profound rejection yeah. of the civic degradation or the social death that is yeah the practice of mass incarceration you know i mean and it's not just when you're locked up it's i mean what's so powerful about your book is it shows that that is a logic that is like a tr you know like an unstoppable truck that comes yeah. at people nonstop. you know and so i feel like that is really ties to your point jamila about about power because in that that's like saying that this is a that this could people have to be the center of decisions about their own lives and about and voice in society more broadly too um, and that these policies that you're talking about work to deny that aggressively. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a great point. I have zero to add. This is this is this is so lovely. Well, then the thing that I'm going to throw at you next is a, a is a potential policy that's you know that there's a lot of optimism around reparations. Um, Darnell, particularly, you know, uh, CPEP alumni that we're all very familiar <laughs> with, um, raises this question. He's on his way to law school right now. And so he's been thinking a lot about um, <laughs> sort of laws and policies. And he asks, you know, to what extent should re reparations, you know, HR 40, um, go beyond monetary compensation and, and include some form of red, redress for blacks imp impacted by mass incarceration. And so, you know, he puts out some suggestions. He's curious what you're thinking about in terms of mass pardons, mass commutations. You know, is there, are you, what are your views um, in thinking about a particular sort of policy that is being raised to address the harm that has been done to black communities, um, you know, historically, as well as with regard to mass incarceration? I love this question. I think that's spot on. I think I think I think we have to be thinking in these terms. You know, I, I think I think we have to be thinking in these terms. So 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 uh, the idea of mass commutations, mass pardons, uh, the idea of 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 uh, that, that Jamila raises earlier about you know folks uh, being empowered um, and not you know moving away from a charity kind of. Uh, uh, framework that the, the point that Julie raises about the utter rejection of 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 old frames and a and a and a and an embrace in this question on repair is necessary. I think that that stuff is necessary. We see some of that movement on things people have learned um, to be sympathetic toward, like drug use. So in the state of Illinois, uh, there there been a wave of uh, 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 pardons and and 
uh, et cetera, in relation to uh, previous drug crimes as uh, for marijuana. Uh, but but see, see where we start taking around the edges because the, the, the framing is still a charity based frame that needs a sympathetic mm-hmm. figure. And so, and so, and so, to move away from the need for sympathy and to move to a place of ethical commitment that has nothing to do with how you feel about a person or a group, um, but that you do it because we've decided in this moment it's the right thing, brings me great hope. So, so, to, so to think about Black people as the recipients of care, of repair, of 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 the state doing its job to make sure that there's a place in the world. Uh, for them, which include rights, privileges, and also responsibilities. It's a part of living together that people can 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 can, can engage in their responsibilities. Like that to me is fantastic. I do not want to downplay the importance of a check. I think mm-hmm. checks need to get written. I think I think checks have been written. Mm-hmm. I think people need dough. I, 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 I think I think I think dough takes us about 50 to 65 cents mm-hmm. on the dollar. If if we if we address these grave, this, so, so listen, I, I'm not saying black capitalism will save us or, or, or folks doing well or something. That's, that's not my point at all. I want to, my point is that people are broke and starving yeah. and dying of poverty, dying of poverty unnecessarily, unnecessarily. And a check and a consistent check would prevent that. And, 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 and anyway, so, 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 so there's the, the check is necessary in my mind for right now. Like, like that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, the, 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 the kids dying in the street right now, cut a check, cut, stop playing, cut the check. Like that, 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 that's a move um, that I think needs to happen. Okay. So I have, I'm going to do one more CPEP question and then sort of transition. I, I'm looking at the clock. I can't believe we only have 15 more minutes because I think we could keep talking for hours. Um, but so th- this, I'm going to transition um, a CPEP question and then sort of go into some of the Q&As that are being um, sent to me from the audience. But they're both, you know, the questions that I'm holding right now are both really um, related. And so one of them um, comes from Sarah. And, you know, one of the things I think we think about when we talk about ma- mass incarceration is really men, right? We've talked about how they get front and center in this and that women um, and the increase in incarceration rates for women and mothers have been very much sort of downplayed and or not, you know, not highlighted the way in which we sort of center men. And so um, Sarah writes, you know, one in six women nationally and a staggering 86% of all incarcerated women are survivors of sexual assault. Three quarters of these women are abused at home and over half are abused as children. And this is a quote from your your book in particular. And she says, as a formerly incarcerated woman and survivor of sexual assault, this, this statistic really resonated with me. Further, I spent many years exchanging stories laced with pain of assault, trauma, incest, and molestation with other women. Do you believe you know, this adds a, another layer to the hardship of reentry. And if so, what can be done um, when, when we are forced back into our, our um, you know, communities uh, with commitments and to live in the same towns as the people that violated us? And I see this, um, you know, as a, as a deeply personal question, but also a kind of a question of like thinking about all of these layers of hardship for reentry, right? Um, and so I'm going to, you know, sort of add that question to uh, audience question member, uh, audience member's question, which really asks about um, about the pr- probation system, right? As as it also a sort of another layer of hardship. So a lot of reincarceration often has to do with probation and parole um, violations and sort of very minor ones. And so thinking about all of these layers of hardship the layer that Sarah mentions in terms of sexual assault and sort of re-entry into communities that have harmed us, um, and then sort of the role of, of probation and parole in, in prison, in the prison from tra- the prison transition. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm starting to take the position, and I feel like I've heard this from uh, scholar Shad Maruna um, mm-hmm. or, or my dear friend Fergus McNeil or both, that the, the, the state should take the position of doing no harm. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we think about probation and parole, um, largely probation because probation is such a big, it's so much bigger um, than parole, but, th- but it's essentially the same thing as community supervision. We know that something like a quarter of all prison admissions each year are due to probation violations. So things like piss and hot, like, you know, that could be alcohol or marijuana in a state where it's legal, um, you know, missing an appointment with the parole, probation or parole officer, you know, these kinds of things can get you sent back to prison. And if not back to prison, at least to a jail stay, which can go anywhere from a couple of days to, to a couple months 
um, in, in some jurisdictions in the city of Detroit. Uh, the, the, the folks that, that, that I follow will talk about this is quote, laying the offender down. There was a place in the Detroit Detention Center called the I Drop facility that was um, uh, cordoned off for parole violators. So even if they didn't feel like it was a powerful enough offense to send you back to prison, they keep you in jail for up to 90 days. What does it mean to disappear three from your family mm -hmm. for 90 days? What does that do? How do you keep a job? How do you keep, you know, the, 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 the sample that was arrested 10 times on average, remember we opened with this, like thinking about these stats and then going into the stats a little bit, like the, the findings of this large recidivism study that 44% of the 400,000 people that got followed across 30 states, most of whom recidivated over 80%, that 44% that of that sample was arrested 10 times on average. The, the, how, how, do you, how do you then connect with your child? Uh, so to this, to this, this question about women's incarceration and that, so, so, and also to this question about the role of the state, I mean, I'd love to hear um, from 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 Anna, from you, from 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 uh, uh, Julie, from 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 Damila, of course. Also, uh, but just to to, to to raise this question of sexual trauma, and and the kind of violence, it's not even in the framework of of, of folks when they're deciding where a placement should be. It's it's not even on the minds of of the of the prosecutor when they put you away. They don't think to themselves, this is someone, 80 something percent of women, this is the case. It says to me that when I'm, and that's reported, mm -hmm. yes. reported violations. We know that probably half of what happens to somebody gets reported. Mm -hmm. And this isn't even a consideration. It's nothing that we even think about when we lock somebody up for five years, 10 years. That that's we think about it only when we think about uh, survivors who have killed their abusers. We think about that sometimes, and that's that's egregious. We don't think about that nearly enough. Um, but it is the case uh, for, for for most women because we prey on women in this country, and and it's something that we that we haven't um, reckoned with fully. I found something not to diminish that point. This does not diminish that point. I just want to say something about the 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 profundity and the ubiquity of sexual violence. I found that many of the men that I talked to have been sexually assaulted, but it took many, 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 many interviews and years of knowing folks mm -hmm. before they shared those stories with me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm, I'm curious. So yes, I think it's an extra layer and I think we need to take extra care about it. I think we're just completely overlooking it, but I'd love to hear. Um, well, uh, I mean, I think what, like, what you said really makes sense to me about how it's not even thought about when yeah. we think about placement, just like you talk about in the book, parenthood isn't thought about when we think about sentencing, right? We're not saying, wait a second, this man or woman has a four-year-old, a two-year-old, a six-month-old. It's not considered all. So just think about how many things are not thought about, right? Mm -hmm. when, we, when we think about placement, when we think about sentencing, um, and how that really underscores your, your argument about humanity. Like, we're not, we're not considering anyone's humanity. Mm. And just yeah. think about how many people cycle through, you know, the system that whose humanity isn't being considered, right? Jamila. Yeah. And I was just going to say, it also underscores how many things about our social life we are, we refuse to reckon with, right? right. So the fact that so many women and so many men are experiencing sexual violence, that we know this that we know it, we have it recorded, and we know that even what we have empirical evidence of is in invariably, inevitably an underestimation. And so the problem is even deeper than what we know, and what we know suggests that the problem is, is extensive and deep. We know this, that it's traumatizing, that people are being traumatized through sexual violence, and that it's a really deeply embedded problem in our society, and we refuse to reckon with it. We refuse to reckon with it in the courts. We refuse to reckon with it in, in various care systems, in foster care That's systems, right. and like uh, you name the system, we're not reckoning with it. And so these the, the quiet parts that we won't say out loud and that don't actually get reflected in the decisions that we're making are demolishing people's lives, That's demolishing right. people's lives. And then the parts that we will say out, out loud, well, why did you make those choices? Well, That's why right. did you have personal responsibility? are completely blind, deaf, and dumb to the quiet parts that have much more force in the world and that we can actually do something about, right? So we choose to focus on personal responsibility and to ignore the fact that 
many, many people are being violated sexually. And, and that those choices reflect absolutely an undervaluing of human dignity and a lack of, of, of true empathy and a lack of commitment to one another on a, on, a, on a kind of moral level. And we pay, we pay for those choices. When people start talking about how expensive, you know, mass incarceration is, I'm like, we, we're paying for our own sins, mm -hmm. right? And, in, and along the way, everybody is being hurt. So what is the point? Why are we doing it this way? I mean, there's too many answers to that, but mm -hmm. it's really quite profound and your book draws out so much of that. I appreciate that. Um, so another audience question, I think as we're looking at the time um, is, you know, do you have any advice for those of us with family members in prison? I mean, your experiences, what your book shares and tells, what, what you know, piece or two of advice would you, could you give? Thank you uh, for asking that. So I'm real careful about advice that I give about most things, um, just just because I've been so wrong about so many things in my lifetime, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so and so and so. Um, what I will say um, is um, is I think boundaries are really, 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 really important. I think I think I think boundaries are really important, and uh, and. And uh, th this is this is kind of a takeaway from the last discussion, and also um, a point that that I'd, I'd like to return to before we sign off, which is um, the the power of an ethical commitment. And that ethical commitment has to be to yourself and to and to the stranger um, and to people you love, you know. Um, and the commitment the commitment supersedes. How you feel about a thing in a moment, but that, but the see, so 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 for me, the ethical commitment that I've drawn for myself means that I have to draw boundaries because people are wild and 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 will act that way, and I don't mean wild like savage or something like that. It's not what I'm saying at all. I don't want anybody to misread this. Like 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 I'm saying that people will take advantage of you, even people you care for, and also. Uh, people will take advantage of the people you care for. And so, and so the commitment that I draw for myself to make sure that I maintain a level of stability and personal well-being and, 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 and health, mental health, spiritual health, emotional health, a connection to the people who I love, I, make I try my best to make sure that that's not, that that's not um, uh, the thing that I'm sacrificing on the altar of doing good. Like those things are very important to me. Um, and at the same time, the ethical commitment is the thing that propels you to do good, even with, when sometimes doing good hurts. And so for folks with people with loved ones who are incarcerated, you know, I'll say the thing that is, that is, that is, that is no secret is it's difficult. It's difficult, um, but you're not alone. One in two families has an incarcerated loved one. Uh, uh, and I think that you count, that you don't have to be so small in this story, you, uh, that 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 you lose um, sight of the things that are, that that are, that that you need for 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 you to make a life for yourself and the people that you care for. Had I not drawn boundaries, I would have been sucked into a bunch of rabbit holes that I don't know that I would have um, been able to pull myself out of. That's I don't want to advocate for fear. I just want to be real. I want to be real. Um, and if I didn't make an ethical commitment to my brother and to uh, people with criminal records, it wouldn't have gotten me off the couch on days when it was really comfortable, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah I, I could feel the boundaries oozing out of the book. Look, when you're talking <laughs> about your brother, there's one point early on where you're like, and he couldn't come back to my house because, <laughs> and it was just like all nonchalant. Like once you cross that line, you cross the line and now you can't come back to my house. I love you. I'll drive you wherever you gotta go. I'll help you. But there's a there's a boundary to protect me and my family. And I thought that was really understated and subtle, but it was kind of beautiful because it's really huge, right? Especially for those of us who in a variety of ways are caring for others, especially when you end up in this position where you're, you're the one everybody knows who has the most money, the most That's everything, right. the most right. connections, the most... And it's it, it's not long before your your drain completely dries. So I I love that. 
I, so 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 I, I I think this is the burden of women and people of color to do service, to be viewed as the person who does service, to be drained dry if 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 if, if, if we stay open to, to, to that move. And I think it's more women than 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 just people of color. Like I I I my maleness allows me to assert some things, I think. Um, and get away with it, like to be absent in, in, in ways, you know, whether that's at the faculty meeting, like at the job or on the whatever, like, like you know, like, like that's that's a part of the thing, the privilege I get to assert and it's terrible. Um, I, I actually didn't need to add anything to that. Like what you said was beautiful and powerful. And, and now I feel like I'm engaging in all this madness, which is the worst. No, you just world. did it. No, I'm <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, I mean, here's my job as moderator. Speaking of men um we're gonna have tony come back in <laughs> um and and leave us with our our final question um for the night um thank you so much um i want to just first I, i'm i'm still sort of chewing on the last comment about the reminder that we matter uh that we count and that we we can show up uh ruben and you know as we segue here i just want to take one minute to just to say how, how good it was to, to see you again uh, and to hear you again. Um, I wanna thank our moderators and Anna and Julili and Jamila uh, just for the wonderful dialogue and just back and forth. It's just so insightful. Um, and, I'm, and as I'm thinking about your remarks, your most recent remarks, Ruben, um, you know, for me, one of the highlights of my professional career has been to have found my way to a translational science center where we can take the work that we do and translate it for the benefit of the communities for whom the consequences matter and then be in dialogue with them in relationship with them and observe their good work and try to understand it and see if we what we can do to leverage it and amplify it in the way that we can and i gotta be honest there's a thread of some of your remarks that make me really wonder and curious about that process is you know when i think about incarceration stats and numbers. They're all daunting and most of them sound awful. Um, could you leave us uh, with some thoughts of hope, hopefully, um, around what is still in need when it comes to scholarship and research? I mean, is there a study that the world is waiting for? Is there a narrative that people need to hear? Is there a number? that people need to see to really move the needle. I'm really struck by the notion of empowerment. It seems like that's the call right now is to try to empower people, but what role do researchers play in, in improving things for, for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals? Such a hard question. Um, <laughs> I, <all, laughs> okay, the, 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 let me just say a place to see holes and then, and then say, and say, and say uh, wh wherever you feel like you fit in, like like you should jump in. Not not there, there's a million things to do. I think I think I think work that expresses the complexity of 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 of, of the human condition, work that expresses uh, the the actually existing living conditions that people uh, experience um, is is absolutely necessary. And I think that work should must um, include at different moments be led by people who are impacted. I don't consider, I definitely consider myself somebody who's impacted by incarceration, but I don't mean me. I mean, we need to make room for formerly incarcerated scholars, for incarcerated scholars. You know, some places do. And I, I feel like, I feel like there's, there's, there's a lot of room for that. I think working alongside uh, uh, people with records, I think, I think finding creative ways to do that. I think, I think there are a million studies um, that can happen. I think we don't understand as well as we could um, any of the things uh, that, that 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 people experience who've been through an American jail or prison, and and in, in in that way, I think there's lots to be done. Um, so so maybe I'll. That's the best I can do, man. <laughs> you know, like, that's the best I can do. Hey hey, I I got it. I appreciate the I appreciate the the reflection there. Um, as we wrap up, I want to take a minute and thank the audience who who stayed tuned in their evening. Thank you very much for joining us on this, this wonderful conversation. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Miller. It was, it was wonderful hearing from you and share, getting your insights. And I really do. I saw the link in the chat. Hopefully people will go out and check out your book. If they don't have it already, it's wonderful. Absolutely. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, and of course, thanks to all of our moderators uh, for, for your wonderful conversation and guiding us through this wonderful conversation tonight. 
So thank you kindly. And everybody have a good night. Thank you all so much. Thank you. All right, buy the thank book. It's all. amazing. Buy the book. Bye, <laughs> y'all. So thank, you. thank you all. Thank you, Ruben, so much. Oh, this is this is just great. Okay.